Hey everybody, this is Reverend James Meeks. I'm the pastor of the Salem Baptist Church of Chicago. I am here with our executive pastor, Reverend Stephen Thurston. We don't use the title executive pastor a whole lot, but he is. That means he's the man with the plan. He's running <laughs> stuff. We're in the studio with uh, Carnell Pickett, who is our mastermind behind the scenes. And what a joy it is to spend these uh, 12 to 14 minutes with you talking about black history. Now, the first thing I need you to do is hit the share button and share this with somebody or do like we used to do in the old days, text somebody <laughs> and say, hey, get on Facebook Live now, listen to uh, Reverend Stephen and Reverend Meeks as they talk about black history. I want you guys to know that I love you. I want you guys to know there's something exciting that's happening in Salem. This Sunday, we have 100 and 14 candidates to, bapti to be baptized. If you have never been baptized yourself, if you've never been immersed in the water, for whatever reason it is, no shame in your game, but this Sunday you need to do that. Why don't you contact us now at the church, let us know that you've never been immersed in water and that you want to be a part of this giant big baptism. So we're here, and uh, Reverend Stephen, what we got up today? Well, I'm glad to be with the GOAT today, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about black history, and you have done so many historic things, especially oh, yes. within the Roseland community, you know, for the kingdom of God. So I'm glad to be standing alongside of you working in ministry. So thank you well, for the opportunity to share. Talking about black history, and I was seeing, seeing, seeing something on Facebook on my timeline. Uh, there's a teacher at my dad's church, and he put up a post that talked about the fact that uh, they didn't steal slaves from Africa. They stole scientists and architects and teachers, people with skill sets, and then they made them into slaves. Yeah. And I think a lot of our young people, they don't have clarity on our history, where we come from, you know, that we come from greatness, that we had great people that were just kind of demonized and belittled and brought down. And so now their context of what they can do, what they can be, has been minimized. And so, you know, growing up in school, I would hear you could be a lawyer, doctor, teacher, preacher, yeah. but it never went beyond that. And there's so many other opportunities. And I think, you know, the stuff that we see in the city of Chicago, especially our young people have lost hope. Yeah, yeah. And their hope is not there because they can't see beyond their current situation. So I think exposure is necessary. You know, one of the things that we make a tremendous mistake in is not studying our history. Two things that you said. First of all, uh, we actually were not stolen in a sense. We, we were stolen. We were not stolen in a sense. We had to cooperate with slave owners. Slave owners didn't go uh, way in the jungle True. to capture people. We had to bring those people to the shore. So first thing, we need to look at how we were tricked into selling our own people out. True. Yes. You know, and so that's one part of our history that I never want us to miss because we are being tricked into selling our own people out now. Yeah. But the other thing about it is to study Egyptology. I went to Egypt once. And I was looking at uh, all the pictures on the wall, and I was looking at how in Egypt, 5,000 years ago, black people were actually operating. They were using anesthesia. Yeah. They were uh, uh, in, on top of all of the medical field, and all of that thing, all of that was happening in Egypt with black people 5,000 years ago. But that's a part of where we have been programmed. If people tell you that you are a jungle bunny and that you were a heathen in the jungles and you were not doing anything and that's where you came from, then you have a perception that that's all you are. Yeah. But had they ever said to us, you know, you guys were scientists, you guys were builders, you guys built pyramids, you guys figured out everything, had they told us that, we would have been saying, oh, well, we are from a mighty people. Yeah. And so... Now we are of age. We can Google, we can go on internet, right. we can search, and we can find out how black people have uh, not only built this country, but the country where we came from, how we built that country. And it's our obligation to do the research and then to pass it on sure. to future generations. Psalms 78 talks about uh, that we're supposed to pass the Bible on to future generations. We're also supposed to pass our own history yes, sir. on to our generations. And if we don't pass it on, then our young people will never know what we have been yeah. and they'll never expire to be. I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't have anything against rappers, rappers, 
uh, artist. I don't have anything against it, but I know that there's more to aspire for. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Even with that, looking back at the history, we often hear, especially in my generation, a little younger, you know, the Bible is is a white and Christianity is a white man's religion. Many people don't know black people were in the Bible. Absolutely. <laughs> and so, you know, younger people will run into Hebrew Israelites that tell them, you know, these myths and these legends that don't exist. And so not only do we lose the oral history and the uh, history of our, our race and our culture, but from a spiritual and a biblical perspective, not understanding that we're connected in the Bible. Black people are in that book. And I think you did a series on that. Well, not only that, but if white people taught certain slaves, taught slaves to read, and the first book that they taught slaves to read uh, in English, remember now, slaves were reading uh, in their own language. Right. They were not reading our language. First book they taught them how to read was the Bible. Worst mistake you ever could do is to teach a slave how to read the Bible. Because if I learn in the Bible how I'm supposed to treat you, I also learn how you're supposed to treat me. Yeah. And when slaves started learning how we are supposed to be treated, that's when we got our dignity and respect and held up our head and shoulders and said, okay, God is on our side. Yes, sir. God, and so the Bible showed us the story that God is on the side of the oppressor. And so we were being oppressed. We said, oh, we got this. We're going to win this thing. <laughs> how do you think we won the battle of slavery? How do you think our people endured it? They endured it because they learned about a God who was on our side, just like he was in ancient Egypt. Definitely. Yeah. So we got a lot to aspire to. We got a lot of work to do. Um, any recommendations? I, I love this element of a baby boomer, and I guess I'm a Gen X. I'm on the verge of millennial somewhere. Yeah, you're there. Gen Xer, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So the insight that I have and then the wisdom that you have and us being able to mix that together, I think that's another great aspect of this church, Salem, the greatest church in the whole wide world because we have this multiple generational piece where we can learn and glean from each other. So why don't you drop some knowledge on me and then maybe I'll drop some knowledge on you. Well, we have another generation and that is Generation uh, Y. Yeah. And uh, those are the millennials. And uh, it's about 24 million, I think it is, millennials. And then we have now Generation Z. Z. And Generation Z is about 26 million. Yeah, somebody nope. can know. Yeah. Generation <laughs> Z are those who were born in 1995. And a young man who led our praise and worship yesterday, he was from Gen Z, 19 years old. Yeah. However, these are adults now. Yes. 20, a 23-year-old is an adult and now in Gen Z. I think the greatest thing that I would, wanted to share as it relates to black history is how I used to feel ashamed of being black. I really did. I was ashamed because our neighborhoods were always impoverished. Our schools were always the worst schools. Whenever I drive in a car, I know when I got to a black neighborhood. Yeah. You can just look at it and tell, yes, oh, sir. God, everything's run down. And I used to wonder, what's wrong with black people? Are we shiftless? Are we lazy? Uh, why can't we get it together? Why can't we organize like every other ethnic group? Until I learned the history. And when I discovered that we have been oppressed for 400 years in this country, we had to work in this country without wages, yes. without being No other ethnic group has ever had to work in America without getting paid. When the Lithuanians, the Poles, the Chinese, everybody who came here, they had a right to organize. Yeah. They had a right to an education. They had a right to a paycheck. We were denied all of that. When slavery ended, it was another 130 years of Jim Crow, yep. which means that we still had uh, schools that we couldn't attend. So we are just now uh, getting to a point where, and, and we're still not equal. Correct. Our school system is still not equal. So when I looked around and discovered all of that, and I saw and I see how far we've come, uh, and we've operated under barriers that have been totally against us, Proud to be a black man. <laughs> I, I, I am proud to have uh, seen our people uh, grow and make the strides progress. that we have and progress. We have a lot of progression to go, but don't ever be, those of you who are African American, don't ever be ashamed that you are an African American. Don't ever be ashamed of where we are in America. Look at how far we've had to come. Look at the hole that we were in. And for people to tell us, let's just forget all of that happened. Let's just start equal. We can't start equal. If we were in a race and you had a 40-minute head 
head start. Exactly. And then I show up at the race and you say, okay, catch him. That's that's that's, that's, that's impossible. Right well, imagine 400 years. Yes, sir. It has a 400-year <laughs> head start. So, no, it's hard for me to catch you, but I tell you what, I'm going to keep running. Yeah, we got to keep running. We got to keep running. And I think that's super important for my generation and younger because you all made sacrifices. You did work in the generations before you. And it seems as if you all had less but did more. We have more and do less. So there's got to be maybe something about our psychology. Something something is happening with my group, but we're not pushing as hard as maybe you all did. I don't know if you do less. My dad, he comes from, I guess the generation would be the silent generation. Okay. He's the silent generation. I'm the baby boomer. Uh, there was so much work to do in America at that time. There's so much work to do now. You all have to do smarter. Okay. You all have to do smarter. And you have to do it the way... You are bent to do it. And uh, I, I don't want to say that this generation of young people, that you are lazy. You are not lazy. You are the first generation who have come here with handheld devices. You have access to information that we used to sit up in the house and, in the, and to argue all night long about whether or not Babe Ruth hit a home run <laughs> uh, in the World Series and uh, or who uh, uh, Max Melling knocked out. We argued all night long. Y'all don't have to argue about nothing. nothing. Everything you have to do is good. So you, what your friend is is research. You need to be able to research and come up with solutions to some problems that we have today. And that's what I would challenge your generation to do. There, pick a problem and solve it. Got that's it. what uh, millennials want to do. That's what Gen Xers want to do. That's a, so, so you guys should pick a problem and then come up with a solution. Don't finger point and talk about, you know, and get us wrong and as millennial, uh, as baby boomers because we, we saying y'all lazy. Y'all not lazy. And, and I'm changing all of my dynamics for how I deal with the younger generation. I want to help you all uh, to be all that God wants you to be and all that you can be. But uh, you need to pick a problem and you all need to solve it. And then you need to celebrate it. Yes, sir. And then you need to pick another problem. Start the process all over Start again. Start the process all over again. Cool. Well, listen, why don't y'all do us a favor if you just join and hit the share button. Somebody needs to hear this. Somebody needs to be encouraged and inspired. Let us know where you're watching from. Chicago, Arizona, Atlanta, all across the globe. Let us know where you're watching from. Any questions or comments that you have, please drop those in the comment section. We would love to hear from you, get some feedback from you so that we can share with you. Let's see. Let's see. Pastor, if anybody dropped any questions. All righty. Everybody saying hello. What y'all want to know? You got us here together. Yeah. Send us a question real quick. We'll uh, answer that question uh, if you have one. Uh, I want you to know, those of you who are watching, that God is on your side. Uh, you don't have to feel bad about the mistakes that you've made. You don't have to feel guilty about where you are not. Most of the time that we're feeling guilty is because we're measuring ourselves by other people that we're seeing on Facebook. Yeah. They done screenshot the best picture they ever <laughs> had of themselves. They done remade it and retouched it. And then we're feeling all bad about our cracks and blemishes and size and all of that. Stop feeling bad. Stop feeling guilty. Stop. God knew uh, exactly every mistake that we would make before he sent his son Jesus and he loved us enough anyway if he loved you then he loves you now and so accept embrace God's love breathe in air say this is God's air he loves me he gave it to me and God wants me to do something God wants me to do something to uh, better my community God wants me to do something to better my church. God wants me to do something. You see, your purpose is connected to uh, what you are here to improve. Everything that's designed is designed for a purpose. The air conditioner, it, it has a purpose. It helps us when we're warm. The heater, it uh, helps us when we're cold. That's its purpose. And so it's fine fulfilling its purpose. The air conditioner ain't trying to be a microphone. Right. That ain't what it does. <laughs> Uh, it, it cools people. It's comfortable cooling people. Yeah. Uh, you might keep people's children so they could go back to school. That's what you might do. You might um, mow people's grass. That's what you might do. You might help people solve uh, problems that they can't find out what it is you love to do. And that's a good hint in your purpose. Find out what you love to do. Dr. King came here, yeah. saw discrimination, 
his purpose became uh, ending discrimination. Yes, sir. So whatever you see that bothers you is probably what God has sent you here to do. Mm -hmm. I'm here to help people uh, spiritually connect to God. I, I, that's what I feel most comfortable doing. That's what I love to do, helping people who don't know God connect to God, connect to the Bible, connect to their purpose. And so you find out what you're comfortable with. And millennials uh, and Gen Xers, I'm going to tell you now, God has some great work in store for you. Your work is not away from the church. You don't have to leave the church in order to do work. Uh, the church, the African-American church, has been uh, the catalyst for yes. helping hold our community together. Woe unto us if for whatever reason we get mad and fall out and leave the church and think that we're going to go somewhere and we're going to build our community outside the church. Jesus said, upon this rock I build my church, and he intends for the church to build up the rest of the world. Yeah. So it's a lady on here that says that she's your girlfriend. Her name is Jamel Meeks. <laughs> uh, uh, and she is. <laughs> yes, sir. She wants to know what are some of the best strategies for your generation passing the torch to some of the younger generation. Very good, honey. Uh, the first strategy is to love the younger generation. I have a daughter who's a Gen Xer. I have uh, a daughter who's a millennial. I have a granddaughter who's... I love them. Yeah. And outside of that circle, just because that's a family you normally love, but I have to love young people enough to be tolerant of where they are coming from. Rather than just saying, sit down, y'all just listen to us, uh, we know best. Uh, we have to love the generation. And then we have to understand the prism by which they see life. We have to understand the world view yeah. of which they've come into life and that their worldview is totally different from ours. And so once we know that, and we, and we have to study that, so that we'll know that, okay, this individual that I'm approaching is not me at 16. Yeah. Me at 16 didn't have a cell phone. Yes, sir. Me at 16 couldn't watch pornography on the cell phone. Yes. Me at 16 didn't have Netflix. Me at so I have to understand them at 16. Sure. Them at 22 in their, context. in their context. And so I have to love that generation enough to understand it, to know it, and then to comfortably, comfortably lay out uh, procedures, strategies, and hopefully give them enough multiple choices that they can <laughs> choose, that they can choose. They don't want to be dictated to. Right. They don't want to be told what to do. But hopefully if we give enough multiple choices, we'll help them choose the right the thing. The right path. Yeah. So what do you say? I've got people on here asking, hey, it feels like we looked at the past and we made some strides, we pressed forward, and it looks like they've changed the game all over again and we're back at square one. Almost as if the progress we made has kind of been erased because they keep changing the game on us. How do, how do they keep pressing forward? Well, uh, it's either to keep pressing forward or sit down and die. die. Yeah, and so we have to look at now, okay, what did the game used to be? Mm -hmm. How has it changed? And now that it's changed, what do we do now in the context of that change to continue to make strides? Yeah. And so it's, it's a study game, and this is the enlightenment generation, and we shouldn't be afraid of research and study. You know, when I was a kid, we used to research with encyclopedias. Yeah, you had all this, the, the books. <laughs> all the Funk and Wagners, they <laughs> stole us. And we had to sit down in the floor and we had to read through all of that. Man, this is the generation of instant information. Yes, sir. So if they change the game, we could study what the game used to be. We could study up on what the new game is. And then, boom, here's our strategy. And that's what we're looking for millennials to do. We're looking for millennials to create strategies. Those millennials who and those Gen Z who are discontented with the church of Jesus Christ, give us your strategy. Give us strategy and say, hey, look, if you all would do uh, X or Y or Z, or have you ever considered having preaching and no music? Or have you ever considered having music and no preaching? Have you ever considered whatever you think your strategy is, you should be comfortable in your local church sharing your strategies with some form of leadership so that we could take a look at it because your idea may be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Sure. We, don't, we don't know it because we don't know your idea, and it's up to us 
to give you a comfortable platform yeah. so that your idea could be shared and appreciated. And that's what we seek to do. Find out a way to give you a comfortable platform, hear your idea, love you for your idea, appreciate your idea, and hopefully implement it. Cool. Well, Pastor, that's our time today. Thank you for dropping your knowledge, your information to challenge us, to uh, charge us to move forward and to keep fighting the good fight for our people. Hey, look, uh, we love you. We thank God for you. And even though it's uh, African American History Month, one thing that we know, and that is love is universal. And we love everybody. everybody. Black lives matter. White lives matter. Green lives matter. Brown lives matter. But I'll tell you what, unsaved lives matter too. And there are a lot of you who fallen out with the church. There are a lot of you who, and the church has a lot of faults. We have a lot of errors. Preachers got a lot of faults. We have a lot of errors. But we represent a God who has no faults and he has no errors. And whatever you do, don't fall out with God. If you're not in a right relationship with God, have your prayer time. Have your Bible reading time. And then when you get a chance, check us out. Look at a church and see because no matter how you try to do it, it's hard to study that book on your own. Yes, sir. And so we love you. We thank God for you. Uh, happy Monday. I'll sign out for my end of it. If you've never been baptized, don't forget now this Sunday, we're baptizing 114 people. You can be one of them. All you have to do is to have believed that Jesus is Lord and the Bible said, and be baptized. And so give us a holler if you want to know more about that. And so I give you back to Reverend Stephen. Love you. And uh, happy Black History Month. I hope y'all have a great day. Keep the questions and the comments coming in. We'll go back later and filter through any questions that you ask. I'd be happy to answer those. Any ideas that you have, drop them here. We want to make this church the greatest church and continue that history and that legacy. So, hey, we're open. We're trying new stuff. We're reaching this year. As Pastor has challenged us, your ideas matter. So drop them. We'll be happy to, uh, you know, consider them and see if we can implement them. And don't forget to hit the share button. That's it. All right, y'all. Holla at you. Have an amazing day.